sorting cycle that like when you bound off the ground, that is a plyometric. Uh, another term that we sometimes use that is maybe not technically plyometrics, but power training. So you can do different types of power training and it's not necessarily a plyometric, but they're often synonymous. So we kind of include those all together. Uh, so in other words, uh, when you see an athlete doing bounding or box jumps, those are just technically those are plyometrics. And um, my old coach used to say, yeah, we, we used to call that jumping back in the day. And he's right. It's just a lot of it's jumping. But there are a lot of ways to load the body to uh, get that effect. Uh, your upper body as well. I've seen some phenomenal feats of power and strength with upper body uh, plyometrics. And we'll talk about that later. Um, you know, the, the primary use is what, what we're looking to do in, in an athletic program with plyometrics is you're trying to bridge the gap. There's, there's a, a gap, there's a, a place where you start in the weight room and you develop strength and you're trying to bridge the gap between the weight room and the power output to the field or the court or whatever activity you're doing. The plyometrics is a huge tool to allow this to happen. Um, I, I would say this, that uh, you have to be careful and not to overload. You know, back in the 80s, uh, there were books that came out that had plyometric drills. So there were coaches that were utilizing every single drill in the book. And there is no magic plyo drill or plyometric drill. They all do the same thing. It doesn't matter if you jump over a cone or over a hurdle or you know over a box. It doesn't matter how you're jumping or what kind of upper body plyometric you're doing or power development. It's all kind of basically the same thing. Um, so it's not magic and you don't want to overdo it, but there is a way to utilize it to allow the athlete to bridge the gap between strength development and as power output. Remember this, uh, having strength is huge and it gives you the potential. It gives an athlete the potential to exhibit high levels of power and speed. But that nervous system has to be trained to elicit that response. So, you know, that that is key. And oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, us strength coaches, we are guilty of thinking, well, we got our guys stronger, so we've done our job. But the job's not over. You have to transfer. You have to be able to transfer that strength to an end product. And in athletics, we want to see speed or power. And, you know, you can measure that in different ways. Uh, but you know what qualities we want. And one thing I want to talk about today that we is almost never talked about in terms of plyometrics is it is a, a very unused tool in developing local muscular endurance. Now that's not the normal use for plyos. And usually in plyos we're we're wanting to develop speed and power and those qualities. But it is a tremendous tool for just general conditioning and in terms of local muscular endurance. And the reason for that is if you do single leg hops and stuff, you are loading to a high degree that muscle that you never get with uh sprinting or running it, it's just different i mean I, i've got some i've done drills that are so hard you, you almost can't finish it but once you get in shape and get to where you can attain those levels your conditioning level is phenomenal okay so let's uh let, let's start talking about uh an example of how you would periodize training and by the way if any of you have questions i don't know if you can reach out to me. If you have questions, you're welcome to interrupt and ask me a question at that time. But uh, let's look at the first month of training. And the way I've approached it, and by the way, this is not just some theoretical program. I've actually done this myself. And I was a, a fairly high level athlete. I threw about 20 meters in shot put and 6150 in discus. You know, I was a, a fairly good athlete and had a, a, a good, good jumps and all the stuff associated with those performances. I like to start my fall preparation with more uh, an endurance approach. And the, the day two in here is a jump run circuit. I borrowed this from a friend of mine who uh, is a great sprint coach here in the United States. And he does this in the fall and I used it and love it. So uh, day one was just a hundred meters of just single leg hopping. And 
you know, so it's not going to kill the athlete, but it's fairly difficult for some. And you can take whatever rest you want. Uh, but what you'll find as the weeks progress, that it gets easier and easier. And each, each single leg bound or hop will get further and further. And you'll be able to cover that 100 meters faster and with fewer hops. That tells you several things. First of all, it tells you that um, the athlete is getting more explosive, but it also tells you is they're getting more fit as well, which in most of our sports, that, that's a huge plus. And we always wonder, well, how, how do you incorporate fitness into this? Um, uh, this is a great hybrid activity. It does develop fitness and explosiveness. Um, so, and, and I would urge you to, to count the number of hops they take and, and urge the athlete to try to jump further each time or jump the 100 meters faster or whatever, however you want to measure it. I think measurement is a huge uh, advantage to do that. So day two is our jump run circuit. Um, this is a great conditioner and it involves some plyos, just in place jumps, but let me kind of go over it real quick. So you start with an in place jump. Um, Kyle has linked some descriptions here, uh, some video uh, of a tuck jump, a pike jump, single leg butt kick, rocket jump. There's several you can use. Um, all of these are viable. You do the activity for 15 seconds and take a 15 second break, then do it again. Okay. So that's, and by the way, that number is changeable. You can go four sets of 15. I think when I uh, started, I started with two reps, built up to four reps at the end of uh, the month. Um, so you're, you're going 15 seconds and resting 15. And then you go right into sprint drills, which, you know, A skips, B skips, high knees, um, whatever sprint drill you want to do about 15 meters, two sets of 15 meters. Then you, you take maybe another a 15 second break and then go into a one minute run. And I usually give my athletes a goal to try to attain if it's, a uh, you know, maybe one lap around the soccer field in one minute. Okay. Something like that. That's not too hard. Uh, that's fairly easy for most. Uh, after the one minute run, we take a minute break. And then we go right back and repeat the jump sequence again and the sprint drills, the same thing. And then we go for two minutes. And, you know, again, you know, they're not just jogging. I, I, I should have been more descriptive, more specific. The two minute run, they're pushing. They're trying to see how far they can go in two minutes. Um, okay, that is one set. Now, for some athletes, that's plenty. I built up to three sets. So you can see that it can be fairly strenuous. After the two-minute run, give them a five- or ten-minute break, and then you repeat it again. And again, you know, like I said, you can go the third time. But it, it becomes a great conditioner. Uh, but again, you're utilizing those plyometrics in this program. It's low level. It's it's uh, they're uh, not not that hard, but it starts to build that that uh, basis of their uh, conditioning and and the explosiveness that you want. Okay, phase two, weeks five through eight, and again, this is changeable too. This is not carved in stone. You can do how you want, but I call this my dy dynamic program. And I did make a mistake. I, I said all drills for two sets of fifteen meters, actually some of the drills I do for 10 jumps. So the A skip and B skip is 15 meters and high knees. The alternate leg bounding, we do 10 bounds and I'm always measuring. So I'm trying to get them to uh, go as far as they can go in 10 bounds. The straight leg bounding, double leg hops, any of those drills that we're doing, we're trying to get them to see how far they can go. Um, uh, I also do single leg hops. I neglected to put that one down. So I'm going to choose about uh, three to four jumps along with the uh, sprint drills. I do that twice a week. And each time we do it, we're trying to exceed the distance that we went previously. Okay. Um, for example, if I have an athlete that can alternate leg bound over 30 meters, I think that's really good. And that gives them a chance to have a high degree of, of sprint speed and all the things that you want to see in, in athletics. Um, same thing with the double leg. Uh, over 30 meters is good in 10 bounds. So, again, you would not worry about the 15. You're, you're going as far as you can go in, in 10 bounds. And we do that twice a week. And um, I, I would say that uh, it's you have to be careful when you put this in your program. I prefer to do it. 
uh, on days that doesn't interfere with your weight training. So you would not want to squat heavy and go right out and do your, your plyometric program. I think that your, your legs would be too tired to elicit the response you want, but, um, uh, place in the program in the, in the proper place. And you can arrange that around your lifting, but it's more effective if you sequence the activity in the right place. Uh, our third phase. Now at this point, we're starting to unload a little bit and allow the athlete to freshen up. And we're looking for very, very high outputs. Um, my favorite things to do are, uh, box jumps, which we used to utilize a lot in the eighties in the United States. We don't do as much anymore. Um, but, uh, you might have a box that's, um, one meter high, uh, or 1.1 meters. So here, 40 inches about one meter, uh, 42 inches would be about 1.1. So if you can do an athlete, if you got an athlete and do three sets of 10 jumps, uh, that's pretty good. Um, and, and that would be a jump that when they come off the box, they hit and go right back up again. And we always emphasized quick and short ground contact times. At this point, we are wanting to get off the ground and trying to build that response in that athlete. And I, I think uh, I think we all realize how important it is to develop uh, a high rate of force development. Well, that's what that develops there. And, and absolutely, we talked about bridging the gap. This bridges the gap uh, between strength and that, that um, nervous system response that we want. OK, um, you also do the same thing with single leg. And I have actually loaded that with weights where maybe you get on a what we would use, maybe a 24 inch box, which would be, um, I don't know, 55, 60 centimeters and do single leg jumps, but hold dumbbells that may defeat the purpose a little bit, uh, because I think you're really looking for a, a faster reaction time. Loading kind of dampens that a little bit. But it can be done if you want to add a little weight. That's that is doable. I've I've done it myself and actually handled a lot of weight that way. Day two, I like to set up sequence uh, boxes or hurdles, so you can go to a track and, and set up maybe six hurdles. And um, if you've got an athlete that if he can make uh, the highest hurdle height look easy, he's ready to do something special. I mean, that's an athlete there, and he's just bounding over the hurdles. Just boom. Boom, just getting off the ground. And it looks easy, He's just floating. He's ready to go. Um, you can do the same thing with boxes uh, where you can you, you can do ascending heights where it gets higher as you go along, or you can just start with a high box. Uh, I think it's important to not give a, an athlete a box higher than they can really do with good form. And same thing with the hurdles. I think you're better off lowering the hurdle height or the box height and keep it um, something that they can confidently do rather than struggling just to barely get over it. I think it's better. It's cleaner. It looks better. And you get more of the response you want to have a, a, a height that's manageable for them. But uh, I, I would suggest maybe you start with six hurdles at a, at a lower height. And as you progress through the month, try to, try to raise it up as you go. Um, one thing I have not mentioned, I think at all times, it's always appropriate to have a test that you like and, and test your athlete once, once a month, either uh, a vertical jump or a, a standing triple jump or standing long jump or 10 bounds, whatever it is that you want to test. I think utilizing that is very helpful. And I, I try to include that all the way through this. So we don't specifically in the last month have that, but I think it's always appropriate to have a test that you like that you're monitoring your athlete. I, I think this, allows for several things. Number one, it gives you a window into his physiology. At that point in time, it tells you what's going on. If he is jumping out of the, uh, you know, if he's going crazy on his jumps, you know something good's going on. If he's flat and he is really just not jumping well, that also tells you something's going on in a bad way. Now, they may just be fatigued and fatigue's part of it. But if it continues and the trend is downward, you need to make a change. You have to adjust the training at that point. Uh, I think I think we all realize the the value of that, and those those small adjustments you make over time can really make the difference. So some athletes may not be able to handle the loading that you're giving them. An adjustment has to be made. Um, 
so I, I would say always monitor uh, what's going on. And, and I think in the weight room, you guys do that uh, constantly. Um, if you see, a, if you're going in on a Saturday, you're supposed to hit 100 kilos for a snatch and he gets to 97 and that's all he can do, That then that's all you do. Um, you know, and you, you begin to make adjustments. Uh, maybe the 100 is just not there that day. Maybe next time it will be. Over a period of time, if he's not going up, then you may have to make a change in your program. Um, the last thing I've got down here is something I call the power drill. And it, it really is its not a power drill, but it, it arguably may be the hardest thing I've ever done myself or had athletes do. It is brutal. And uh, this is done for time. What we did, now, this was the first done on a, an American football field. So I've got down 100 meters on, on our field. We went from the goal line to the far end of the end zone. That's 110 yards, which is 100 meters. So you hop 100 meters on your right leg. And, you know, if you're going as hard as you can, there's a significant amount of lactate that's going to build up in your leg at that point. As soon as you get to the corner, you drop, do 10 push-ups. You frog hop. Now, this is not just a double leg hop. You're squatting all the way down and jumping. Squat, it's a squat jump all the way across the field. And then when you get to that corner, you do 10 pike jumps, which is jumping up and touching your toes in the air. And again, you're just getting off the ground as fast as you can go. Then you hop down the other sideline on the other leg. And by this time, most athletes are stumbling. They're, they're dead. I mean, the overload is extreme. It, it is very, very difficult. Um, most athletes, especially young athletes, won't be able to finish this drill. I, I've, I've very, seen very, very few kids finish it the first time of the younger athletes. And even if you do finish it, it's hard. I mean, this is a hard drill. When you get to the next corner or the end of the 100 meters, you do drop down, do 10 more push-ups, and then you sprint home and you time it. If you can break two minutes, that's pretty fair. I've had athletes do under a minute 45. Um, for that, which is, well, the guy that did it was a, all, well, he was a national champion in decathlon. So that tells you the kind of athlete it takes to accomplish that. Um, so it, it's, it's extreme. I mean, it is a very, very hard drill, not something it's definitely plyometric, but it's a high degree of endurance, local muscular endurance. And that's the part I think that probably has a lot of benefit for, for soccer and all, any kind of sport athlete where you're doing a lot of running and you need endurance. We, we only tend to utilize running for that. The jumping is a tremendous overload and, and can be a, a great training tool that I've used and, and felt like it was very beneficial. Now, you wouldn't want to do that all year long. I think that's something you do early in your preparation. So there's a, a, a place for that. Uh, that would be appropriate in a place you absolutely wouldn't want to use. It's too, it's too fatiguing. Um, but I would suggest maybe, you know, repeating it for uh, uh, once a week or maybe even once every other week for, you know, six weeks or something like that. And their time will drop. Every time they do it, they'll get better at it. They'll get fitter. Uh, and they're just, you know, they're just handling it better. And at that point, man, their confidence is going sky high and, and, um, they're, they're feeling invincible because they're doing things that they definitely couldn't do before. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of a brief outline of, of, of things that I've done with my teams and, and with myself in my own training. Um, I would say this, that you know, we talked about bridging the gap. Uh, I think that really is a key. We have all seen athletes that are strong in a weight room and they just, their nervous system just cannot respond at a rate that allows them to exhibit their strength on the field. So really at that point, the strength becomes useless. Um, we don't want that. We want an athlete. I'd rather have an athlete that is not strong, but can do everything you want on the court or the field. They can jump, they can run. Uh, you give him a little bit of more strength and he, they always transfer it well. So we want this transferability. And I, I do think the plyometrics is a, uh, a great way to do that. I, I would I would urge you not to overdo the plyometrics, uh, especially in, in sports where you're already jumping a lot, like volleyball. I think once or twice a week of specific uh, plyometric training can be useful, uh, but not a lot of volume because every day in practice they're they're jumping, so they're getting a lot of volume in anyway. Um, I think 
plyometrics have the potential to injure an athlete. I think that's a caution. You have to um, you have to be careful in your loading um, and not to injure an athlete. Uh, I've seen lots of kids get hurt Achilles tendons and uh, knee injuries, shins, all these things, because honestly, they just did too much. Uh, sometimes, especially, like I said, back when I was a young coach in the 80s, plyometrics was a big thing. And and uh, some coaches felt like they had to have all these different variations. I would say keep it simple. Uh, find the, the drills that you like and that the athletes can do well and focus on that. You, you don't need to do a lot of different things. And if your kids are, or if your athletes are getting better, that that's all they can do. So if you've got a program that, that's doing that, then that, that's perfect. That's what you want. Uh, there is no magic jump. There's no magic drill. Um, it's all about, I would say this to you, that the results you get is going to come down to the skill you bring to the table in terms of piecing together a program that allows for recovery, adaptation, and all those things that make a, a, a successful program and your ability to adapt uh, what you're seeing. So use your eyes and monitor, always monitor and, and use your eyes to see what's going on and make those adjustments. And that will give you your best, success for, uh, best chance for success. And I would say if in doubt, do the minimum, not the maximum. Uh, some of these drills are very, very uh, stressful. And uh, I would say it, it kind of shows a little bit of my background. It was old school. I'm, I'm older. So I, <laughs> I'm an older coach. And I came up in the 80s. That's when I was competing, 70s and 80s. And, uh, you know, we did things a little differently. We understand a little better now that you don't have to do something every single day or a little less can be a great thing. It doesn't have to be more and more and more. So I think that's especially true with plyometrics because the potential there to overload is extreme. Um, so I would caution you to use good judgment and always use your eyes, coach with your eyes when you're uh, utilizing the, the plyos. Um, John, that's really all I had. Do we have any questions? John, do you have anything that, uh, or any questions from the coaches? Any question? Me, I don't have a question. Alex from Botswana, Mr. Milton. Hi, Hi John. Alex. How are you? I'm all right. Yourself? Good, good. I would just appreciate uh, for you for taking out time to share with us some of the, your experiences as uh, young coaches in our sport to learn from. So it's just an appreciation, sir. Thank my, you so my much. My pleasure. And, and good luck to all of you in your upcoming seasons. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah, this is Andy uh, from Ghana. Uh, I think he did very good with the presentation and it's very clear, self-explanatory and all. So I would say a very good thing, a very big thank you to him for his time as well. I really, I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Andy, and, and greetings to Ghana. I have had many uh, Ghanaian athletes that I've coached and loved all of them. They were wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your time as well and your good work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sarah's hand is up. No, what, what, what was he calling it? A shot? Oh, jump box? The plyometric box? No, no, no. Uh, the chat message. Oh, the chat. Sarah's, yeah, Sarah's just text. Uh, where? Where's that at on my screen? Let me. I'm not seeing it. Uh, well, the question is, does this apply if you get injury during training? Do you simply simplify the sessions or reduce the number of sessions? It, it, it depends on the injury. Uh, I think if you have anything significant, you may, be, may have to eliminate the plyos or certainly modify and, and volume. I think all of that is on the table. So in, in case of injury, I think you have to be really, really careful. Uh, if it's a severe injury, then I would totally eliminate the plyometrics for a while. Then you can reintroduce them in smaller amounts. Um, but yeah, you, you've got to use... Uh, um, discretion when utilizing an injured athlete in this program. So yes, you do have to modify 
and or eliminate sessions or do what's necessary, they have to get well. I mean, that is the most important thing. Uh, thank you so much for making time for us this early. Uh, it's my pleasure. And thank sharing, you, everybody, for, yeah, for allowing me to share with you guys. That was fun. Yeah, we really appreciate your time and the knowledge uh, experience that you're sharing with us. Uh, it, 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 I know it helps a lot. And uh, we, we're looking forward to, you know, uh, having more presentations from you. And if you have friends and or uh, colleagues who would wish to, you know, share with us anything, we really welcome them. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.